But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight in prayer, in the name of your Son. As it has been, Lord, with all the other men that have preached here this conference, I have no desire for empty rhetoric or eloquence or even to show a mastery of any discipline, but that the word of God would go forth. Father, we have nothing, we have nothing but your son. He is our boldness before you. He's our confidence. He is our hope. Father, you know. So please help. For the sake of your son, for the sake of your church, for the sake of those who have yet to be gathered in, for the sake of generations to come, help us, O oh Lord. Help us. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. It is always the greatest privilege for me to speak here in this place. In the last few days, I've met with missionary groups after missionary groups after missionary groups, and it is such an honor to meet with the men, many of whom, most of whom, have been sent out from here. Now, I'd like to do something by way of illustration. I would like for every missionary to stand up. Just stand up. Now, pastors, those of you who are pastors, I want you to look at the missionaries. Look at them. Missionaries, I want you to look at the pastors. Look at them. Now, do you want to know the difference between those of you who are seated and those who are standing? There's only one thing, location, location. Please be seated. Now, why do I say that? For the last several decades, we have bought into the lie that there is some sort of mysterious and esoteric knowledge with regard to doing the missionary work. And it is all a lie. It is all a substitute for sola escritura. Now, how do you plant a church on the mission field? The same way you plant a church here in this country. You do the work of an evangelist. And those who are converted, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you give your life teaching them the full counsel of God. And then according to 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, as a pastor, you give your life to training up elder qualified men. And among those elder qualified men, some of them will go beyond your church to plant another church. Not a new church for a new generation. Not a different church for a different social group to plant another biblical church of like faith. That's the work of missions. And I could sit down right now. And if missionaries around the world would only obey that, it would transform missions as we know it. I can tell you I am sick 
and tired. And again, I'll use this word of this belief that there is some sort of strange and esoteric knowledge that belongs only to missionaries. And when they go out into the field, they must be possessors of this knowledge to be used of God. But it is this very knowledge, if you could call it such a thing, that has brought ruin to the Great Commission. Brought ruin to the Great Commission. Someone asked me one time, when I was in Peru, I worked a great deal in the city of Lima, but also would make uh, missionary trips up into the Andes Mountains and missionary trips into the, the jungles and, and spent a lot of time with a, a tribe called the Aguaruna tribe. Some of the Aguarunas had more contact with what we'd call a contemporary civilization, but many of them were very, very far removed. And a man asked me one time, how do you preach the gospel to an Aguaruna tribesman? And I said, I don't preach the gospel to an Aguaruna tribesman. I preach the gospel to a man. A man. A man. And that is why literally every time I come here, every year, People think it's a labor. Why do you meet with missionaries all day and all night? Why? Because it just gives me the greatest encouragement because all of them say the same thing as though they've learned it by rote. I say, what are you doing on the mission field? I'm planting churches through preaching the word of God. And I preach the word of God in the street and I preach the word of God in the pulpit and I preach the word of God behind the counselor's desk and I preach the word of God in the house and I preach the word of God in the market. That is the Great Commission. Difficult. No, not difficult. Impossible. But that's the Great Commission. So I think I would have most, if not all the leaders here behind me by saying, don't come in here with all that silly stuff. With all those strategies that are so mutable, this year we'll have a new missionary strategy, next year there will be another one, and then another one, and then another one, and all of them are just a pitiful excuse for not obeying Scripture. And none of them have power. None of them. They're as weak as a dish rag. Give me more of many of the men I know here who have cast off Saul's armor. They've cast it off. And they've taken up the smooth stones, the gospel, and they'll face any giant with them. Not only have I heard them say that here, I've watched many of these men that you have here on the field. They're not racehorses. They're plowmen. They're sowers. And they're reapers. That is the Great Commission. One of the most wonderful mission works in the world today is in Zambia. And now it is transferred over also into Kenya and many other places. And what is their secret? It is no secret. They're doing the same thing that you men are doing here. They have devoted themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. That is the Great Commission. And that's all we need. That's it. That's it. Now, when we look at our text, and I love this text, it says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. I believe that some commentaries make too little of this passage and other commentaries make too much of it. They were doubtful, distasso. They were double stepping like Peter on the waves. But what is the great truth that we can draw from this? They were like us. Now you write this down. If you don't remember anything else I've said, there are no, there never has been a great man of God except for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There are only weak and pitiful men of a mighty God. God that finds some sort of delight in choosing the runt of the litter and in that runt's weakness to make him strong. 
to make him strong. As a matter of fact, I would say this. In the scriptures, in biographies that I have read, and in my own life, and in many of the brethren with whom I often converse, every trial, every mountain, every giant, Everything presented before us that we simply cannot overcome has one specific design. I could say to weaken us, but let's go further. To show us our weakness. To empty us of our wisdom. To empty us of our carnal strength. To empty us of any gifts we suppose we have. And to draw our life and strength from Jesus Christ. Oh, my brother, your problem is not that you're too weak. Your problem is you do not know how weak you are. And in order to find that weakness, you are going to be crushed. Extraordinary men suffer extraordinary things so that they're made weak and helpless and they look to one hope, one hope, one hope. You see, it's a coin with two sides. We can do nothing in Christ, without Christ. Nothing in ourselves. Nothing in ourselves. But we can do everything within the providence and will of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so when these men come to him, however weak or however strong that they might have been, the text literally says Jesus goes out to meet them. He goes out to meet them. He knows their weakness. And he has chosen some of them for this very reason, so that in their weakness, his strength would be glorified. His strength would be magnified. Because never forget it, no matter what we do as preachers or missionaries or whatever else we are, no matter if we spill our blood as martyrs, know this, there's only one hero in this story. Mark it down, it's Jesus Christ. And every good, Everything that's ever been accomplished in any of us, ever any sound word ever spoken is the result of his life and wisdom flowing through us. And here we see something of a sandwich. On one side, here in verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then in verse 20, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. What strength is there? What strength is there? You know, I have served in the jungle with men who seemed to be fearless. They looked for trouble. They looked for it. And I admired them in that strength. But I've also seen men in that jungle that were scared of their own shadow. And would come out of the boat and go into the monte, into the deep part of the jungle with fear and trembling and weeping. And they I admired more. Because in spite of all their weakness, in spite of all their fear, and even sometimes at night I would catch them weeping when the insects had tore their body apart. They did it for him. And they did it in his strength and in weakness. They were made mighty. He's everything to us. Brothers, he's not just all that we need. He's the only thing we have. And if you think not that way, I have just identified the problem with your ministry. We can do nothing without him. We can do anything within his providence, within his will, within his degree, with him. There is nothing commanded that we cannot accomplish. There is no task given to us by his providence that cannot be carried out in his power and his wisdom. I remember the passage in, in Genesis where Joseph is, is taken out of the dungeon, and he's presented before Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, without your word, not one finger, not one foot, no one will move in Egypt. 
Oh, but my Lord ascended up and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And apart from his word, his decree, not one foot, not one finger can come against us. Oh, they will come against us. Oh, and yes, it will hurt. You're not going to get out of this battle without scars. But they cannot prevail. They cannot. Not because of you, not because of your will, not because of your power, your strength, but because of the one who sits on the throne. They cannot prevail. And the church will prevail. Because he'll see to it. He will see to it. I know this. That if all the armies that have ever been of men and demons amass in one mighty force against my Lord and come against his throne with a full strength, it'll be like a tiny gnat beating its head against the world of granite. And this is what gives us our strength. This is what makes the weak strong. Knowledge of God, knowledge of Christ. You don't need this or that or these things that are sold in the evangelical market. Your need is knowledge of God. In the book of Daniel, we're told when all hell breaks loose, those who knew their God would be strong. Do you see that? Now, I want you to see here something that's very important. He says, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We've already established his authority so far in this message. We've spoke much about his authority. But here's what I want you to understand, preacher. To go out in his authority, you've got to go out under his authority. To go out in his authority, with his backing, with his shield, with his power, you have to go out under his authority. And therein lies the problem. We have seen whatever movement was going on of so-called uh, resurgence of reformed truth. We have seen much of it dissipated. We have seen much of it turned to nothing. We have seen in one year confusion come over so many people that you no longer know who stands with you, who stands against you. What in the world is going on? And you know why, why that happened? Because the Reformation was not primarily about some agreement with an academic view, an academic Calvinism. The Reformation was founded upon sola scriptura. And I want you to know, brethren, I love the reformers. I love to read the reformers, but I'm really getting tired of that language. The reformers didn't call themselves reformers. They just wanted to be biblical. And you can sit in Starbucks all day long with your skinny jeans on and talk about reformers, or you can pick up a Bible and start getting biblical. And I don't know why you're clapping. Brethren, we are going to stand before Christ. Even those of us who through faith are fully accepted in the beloved. And, and I do not know, I do not have the theological nuance to put this together. I only know that it's true. I am justified before God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. A wide entrance will be opened unto me because of his blood. And yet I will stand before God and I will give an account. Have you ever sat up in the night watch and pondered that? The gravity of that. No, I don't know how to put the two things together. There are theologians here that could come up and clear up my mess later. But I do know that those things are reality. And brother, as you grow into the knowledge that I am going to give an account, that you're going to give an account, a, a sane man, a sane man would find it very difficult to have a sense of peace, knowing that we are given to many failures, 
many errors, knowing that we have to fight against apathy and so many other monsters against our faith. How can a man have any peace at all knowing that he is going to be standing before God, that his works are going to be tested as by fire? And all of us, I think, would agree that at least to some degree, we are going to see words and works burn. How can we have any confidence on that day? I'll show you. Go with me to 1 Timothy. Over and over again, everywhere, everywhere I go, I touch on these verses, and the usual response is a yawn. And I don't know why. Have I put emphasis? Am I overemphasizing something? I don't think so. 1 Timothy 3. Paul says in verse 14, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. He's writing Timothy. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. This is one of the most important texts in the entire Bible. I know everyone goes, 2 Timothy 3, 6, 15 through 17. Yes, absolutely, we're going to go there. But this text here is just stands out to me over and over, especially when I look at American evangelicalism, especially when I look at my own supposed reformed brethren. I look at this passage and, and I, I sometimes weep. I sometimes tremble. I sometimes delight. Look at what it says. In case I am delayed, I write. Why does he write? So that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. How can you know how to pastor? How can you know how to lead worship? How can you know how to preach? How can you know how to counsel? How can you know how to do missions? How can you know how to organize a church or, or prepare the ordinances or anything else? How can you know? He says, I write, I write, I write. Do you see that? The only way you and I can know how to conduct ourselves in the household of God is through what is written. Do you know what my prayer would be for every man in this place? Two things. God, open our eyes to what this text is saying, and then this. And this is something that should be the daily prayer of every minister of Christ. Lord, increase my fear of thee. Increase my fear of thee. You say, Brother Paul, you're supposed to be talking about missions, but you're talking about church. Let me share with you something. I would put an end to every, and this is going to get me in trouble. I would put an end to every missiology department in every seminary in the world. And you know what I would do with that missiology department? I would put it under ecclesiology. Because missions is simply the church extending itself in the Great Commission. And the problem with missions today is we don't know how to conduct ourselves in the church. And one of the reasons why we're not concerned with knowing it is because we don't understand the second part of this. It says the church is the household of God. It is the church of the living God. Christ's church, Christ's way. You are a steward. Nothing less than a steward of the Most High God, and nothing more than a steward of the Most High God. And as a steward, it is not your prerogative to invent or scheme or design. Moses was not asked to design a temple. He was told, obey everything on the mountain that was given to you without deviation. Do you see that, brethren? I'm going to give you a harsh illustration. Imagine, that, and I've given this so many places, but it's so important. I want to communicate this truth to you. Imagine that a great king, 
great king. He's going to go on a long journey and he calls you as the steward to care for his bride, his bride that he loves more than, than, than everything, more than his kingdom. And he gives you a list, a kingly decree. This is what you're supposed to do with my bride. This is it. You do not add to this list. You do not take away from this list. This is the list. And the king looks at you with fire in his eyes. Because this is my bride. I use the illustration that oftentimes I would go into red zones in different places in Peru where the terrorists were supposedly in control or the military was kind of dangerous or things were going on. And my wife would want to go with me and I would say, no, 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 no. You're not going. Why? <laughs> they pull me off the bus, push me around, do all kinds of things with me. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. No big deal. One of those men lay a finger on my bride. It changes everything. That's my bride. That's my bride. So I would tell her, I don't want to get you in trouble and I don't want to get me killed. <laughs> and if I, being evil, could love my wife so that I would fight men, what kind of passion does Christ have for his bride? And so listen, preacher, this applies to missionaries, applies to all of us. So he, this king, has always delighted in his bride. Oh, she's beautiful, but she's, she's simple. No painted eyes. No need for rouge. A simple white, long, flowing, elegant dress that he gave her. And then he goes on a journey. But as he goes on that journey, he stays longer than everyone supposes. And you, as a wise steward, begin to realize that, well, the people are no longer interested in the king because they're no longer interested in his bride. She's old fashioned. And so you drop a plan and some of you have drawn up this plan. And some who will hear me through video have drawn up this plan. So you decide. You're going to change her dress. You're going to paint her face. You're going to restyle her hair. And you're going to march her before a bunch of carnal men like a prostitute in order to use her to draw them back to the king. And that's exactly what these church growth people are doing. This is exactly what's going on in America. And it's going on in the mission field and it is wrong. And I want you to know on the day of judgment, do not fear for the atheist fear for the pastor and the missionary who decided that he must change the look of the bride of Christ in order to make her attractive to carnal men, to bring those carnal men back home. Fear, fear, fear. It should be a daily exercise. Oh, Lord, increase my fear of thee. You should look out from that pulpit at that bride of Christ that you're pastoring, that you're teaching and realize this, this thing, this, these people, they belong to him. I will teach them only what the king has told me to teach. I will not add a word to it. I will not take a word away from it. I will treat her as she ought to be treated. I will obey the commands. And I will do so trembling. Know that if I have done it and I have submitted to his decrees, I have done nothing special. I have only obeyed as I should have. Oh, brethren, what's wrong with missions is wrong with the church. Maybe you came here tonight thinking I was going to, you know, start just crying and weeping over the lost. Yes, that's necessary. But brethren, I honestly would tell you before the Lord, if we could, if we could bring back a great majority of missionaries, pull them off the field and put them on an island where there is no people, the kingdom of heaven would advance more greatly. It's true. I'm not trying to be smart aleck or funny. It's just true. If you took all the missionary body around the world, it would be like a thimble cup of men who are devoted 
devoted to the proclamation of the word, to prayer, and to dressing Christ's bride as he has commanded her to be dressed. Oh, brethren, I want to tell you something. People, I, I, sometimes I get up in this pulpit after, you know, when I've been at this conference and I've met with so many missionaries, it sucks no, it sucks no power from me, sucks no strength from me. I met, I met with your Ukrainian guy, yes, it was Greg, I, the, the Christian Anderson over there in Germany, and Martin Manton. I met with the Croatians today. I met with the Spaniards and every one of them. I mean, there's nothing novel about them. They're as boring as they can be because they all say the same thing. <laughs> and what is the thing they say? What almost no one else says. I study the word to live the word, to preach the word. So to go out in his authority, you have to go out under his authority. And there is only one inspired, God breathed, inerrant, without error, infallible, incapable of error. There's only one book. And it's this one. It's this one. I've often said that when I first told my pastor as a young man that I was going, God had called me to preach. First thing he looked at me, just turned around. He said, boy, can you be alone? And I thought he meant if I was a preacher and preached the word, everyone would hate me and I'd be alone. That's not what he meant. That came true, but that's not what he meant. <laughs> he meant this. When all the other boys are running around in bachelor packs and doing all sorts of things, can you be the one that tarries with God, that tarries with him in the word of God, that tarries with him in prayer, that communes with him? Brethren, we don't need strategies. We don't need the newest idea of all these so-called mission experts. What do we need? I'll tell you what we need. We need biblical churches in America. What do I mean by that? We need biblical churches with not just expository preaching, with expository living. Men who don't just preach this book, but conform their ministries, their lives, and their churches to this book. I had a man came, come to me, a very sincere man, a while back, and he's been, he's, he's learning truth and growing and he's pastoring, and he came to me and he said, and, and he has, he's come to a point where he's very mature in his understanding, but his church is not very mature in, 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 in its understanding. And he said, there are so many young men, so many people in my city that have no training. I want to start an institute. And I said, no, no, please don't start an institute. And he said, but Brother Paul, he goes, you know, you know, I've learned so much from the men you've recommended and the teaching. And you know my doctrine and my life. I said, yes, brother, but your church isn't there. And if you have an institute and you bring in a bunch of young men and you train them in all these truths, but your church itself isn't practicing these truths. They will think what most of these reform guys think today. This is just academic jargon. You don't actually have to live it. You don't actually have to apply it. But you do. You do, brethren. You do. Christ's church, Christ's way. Christ's church, Christ's way. It's not the hearer of the word, it's the doer. And that's not just with sound doctrine, that's with sound biblical strategy. Now, with the time I have left, I, wa I want us to go back to Matthew for a minute. Jesus said, 
go. Now we all know that's a participle and not the primary command. The primary command is make disciples. But brethren, we have to go in order to make disciples. We have to go. And we have to suffer. And we have to die. And we have to give. We have to go. William Carey told a group of men, I'll go down in the mine. But will you men hold the rope? And I can tell you this, whether you go down in the mine or whether you hold the rope for those who go down, there's going to be scars on your hands. Where are your scars? Where are your scars? When I was in Peru, there was several very godly missionaries and things that took me in. I owe them a great deal. And there was one, oh, independent fundamentalist Baptist by the name of Carlton Allen. And he was one of the kindest, most godly lover of souls I have ever met in my life. He, he was even worse than me in Spanish. He preached. I mean, his Spanish was horrible. He would spend most of his time acting it out. <laughs> but people loved him. They loved his, his love for souls was just a model for me. It was a model. And I remember he later on had to go back to the States. And I visited him when he was there in the States. Such a kind man. And he had a church. A church of, you know, a small Georgia, South Georgia little church. I don't know, maybe a hundred people on Sunday. And, and they gave like six figures yearly to missions. And I said, Brother Carlton, I mean, how? And he took me by the hand and he led me through their little family life center and their little church and the Sunday school rooms. There wasn't one place, brethren, where you could walk more than a few meters. And there wasn't a missionary picture there. There wasn't some missionary on the wall. Now, I want to tell you something. Those of you who are pastors here, listen to me very carefully. If you are preaching the gospel and you are counseling souls, I mean, I'm talking about Ichabod Spencer, pastoral sketches. You're dealing with souls. You're not treating them as superficial. You are dealing with souls each time as a life and death, heaven, hell matter. Then most of your church is going to be converted. But listen to me. These godly people, these people who are the children of God in your church, they have all sorts of problems. They have family problems. They have work problems. They've got taxes. They've got to work. All kinds of things. They're goodly people. But with all the things running around, they're going to forget missions. Pastor, it's your job to make sure they don't. That they do not forget missions. I mean, put it everywhere. Preach on missions. Put pictures of missionaries on the wall. Pray about missions. Get real about missions. We have to go. There are still nearly three billion people who have not heard a clear gospel. We can't live with that. Now, we can't fall into pragmatism. We must only do that which is biblical, but yet we must be more concerned. I find in the last year, so many people are, they're dividing themselves in, in races and colors and all sorts of things here in the body of Christ here in the United States, failing to recognize there's only one race and it's a human race, but each one vying for his people, this people, that people. I need to talk about my people. I need restitution for my people. I need protection for my people. I need this and I need this for my people. I understand it. I understand it. I really do. Do you know why? Because I'm the same way. I'm the same way. All I think about is my people. It's all I think about is my people. And my people are in the United States of America. And they're in South America. And they're in Central America. And they're in Canada. And they're in every country of Africa. And they're in the Middle East. And they're in North Korea and South Korea. They're my people. And if you want to know what I care about, I care about Zion. 
I care about my people. I used to laugh in Peru. I said, tell my friends, I said, I'm Jesus junk. Whenever there's a group of people no one else wants to go to, it's like the Lord says, washer, get over there. Go get my people. But not only that, go get your people. Go get your brothers. Go get your sisters. Those who have not yet heard, there are people. Someone came to me a while back. Some laws were being passed on the internet and all these different things. And they were worried about Christianity being hindered in America and all this stuff. And they said, Pastor, Paul, you just don't seem interested. I said, because I'm not. I could care less. They said, why? I said, because I got a sister that just got her arm cut off by a mass of Hindus that attacked her husband. Because I got brothers and sisters in South Korea that are being beaten and being raped. Because there are people in the Middle East who have not heard. What do I care? What do we care about the bed we lay in? What do we care about the pain in our bodies? The disintegration of our strength? What do we care? It'll all be gone soon. We must go. But we must go biblically. I have turned down many, many conferences, mission conferences. Why? Because I know when I get up on that platform with 20 mission experts, they're going to have 20 different ideas of what a missionary is. And I know that they're going to tell a bunch of teenagers that they need to get out of school right now and run to the field. And I know I'm going to have to stand there and go, please don't, please don't, please don't. I was at a very large mission org mission meeting several years ago, and I'll never forget it. They were telling young people, go to the field, go to the field, go to the field. And it was all about passion, passion, passion. I wish people would stop talking about passion for just a minute and start talking about caution. And they were coming up to me and they were going, brother Paul, I'm going to the field. I'm going to the field. I said, wonderful. Answer me this question. Propitiation. I give you three minutes. <laughs> Talk to me about elder qualifications. Talk to me about your church membership. Do you see that? Brothers, pragmatism. I was, I was talking to the, our brothers from Spain. And I said, you know, pragmatism, uh, pragmatismo es como una culebra. Hay que cortarle la cabeza. Pragmatism is like a snake. And as soon as you see it, you got to cut its head off. Cut it off. Kind of like when Steve Lawson went to zombie and had to beat a snake to death with his shoe. Do that. <laughs> if you haven't heard that story, let him tell it to you. <laughs> Pragmatism is just the handmaiden of liberalism. And you can have the most sincere, supposed conservative attitude, but pragmatism is nothing more than liberalism dressed in another dress. And it is doubting God and it is doubting God's word. What do we need? What do we need? Let me share with you something. Someone came to my pastor, one of our elders, Anthony Mathenia, and said this. Do you believe that missions is primarily the work of the local church? And Pastor Anthony said, oh, no, 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 I don't believe that. We don't believe that here, that it's primarily the work of the local church. We believe it's exclusively the work of the local church. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that we cannot have institutes and seminaries. But brethren, God did not give us boards and groups and God gave us churches and elders. And I'm going to give you my two cents, but one of the reasons why this place and its missionaries and its school and everything else is standing firm while everyone else seems to be bathed in confusion is because it's under a local church with elders. What do we need? What do we need? We need local churches. I'm an itinerant preacher. I will be here today and gone tomorrow. But the pastor, a pastor, now that, that is something quite special. If I had time, I can go with you through the book of Acts and I can show you there is a transition in the book of Acts. It's apostles, 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 and then all of a sudden an elder, 
Apostles, apostle, elder, elder, elder. When we get to the council of Jerusalem, what do we see? We see apostles, but what else do we see? Elders. And then Paul the apostle, I mean apostle, a real one with a big A, apostle. <laughs> the la- and I might add the last of the apostles. He sent out by a local church. And after he makes his missionary rounds, he comes back and reports to those men. I think to some degree what we're seeing is, is the apostles handing off the baton, not to mission experts, not to church growth strategists. And I want to say this. Um, I love seminaries, okay? Seminary professors are absolutely essential, but didn't hand it over to a seminary. Handed the baton over to elders of churches. And these elders, when a young man comes up, they will nurture that man in the context of the local church. They may, they may call on As you have here, a seminary, a university, they don't let go of those men because it's the church, it's the elders that are responsible. And when those men go out, those men are watched over, cared for, held accountable by the church that sent them out. Now, there are some unusual works of God, like we saw with Charles Spurgeon that we, I believe, see here. It's very large. And yet, what is the strength of this place? It's the elders. The elders. That must meet non-negotiable qualifications. And then those men, 2 Timothy 2.2, along with, yes, Bible colleges, seminaries, those men give their lives to raising up young men. And, And... They don't turn them over to anybody. They're their sons. And when they're elder qualified, those men either stay in that church and work or they go out. They may go out across the city. They may go out across the state. They may go out across the country. They may go around the world. Missionaries, you know, I, I've taught many times with mission groups and, I, and I'll talk about how missionaries must be elder qualified and people go, no, those are just elders. And I said, oh, you misunderstand the passage. Those qualifications, in those qualifications, Paul is just describing a mature Christian and then he's saying elders must be mature Christians. They must be. It's non-negotiable. Are we going to send someone around the world to a people group to plant the first church there that's not elder qualified? Really? Is that what we're going to do? Absolutely not. We send our best men to start those works so that the tree goes down right, its roots are strong, and its fruit is life. And when you lay, pastors, listen to me again. We could use a great dose of the fear of the Lord. When I see sometimes the kind of men that are so quickly ordained, it terrifies me, not just for those men who are ordained, but for the foolish pastors that ordain them. Remember, if the root is rot, the tree and its fruit will be rot. And so what do we have, men? We must go. We must go out in his authority, under his authority. What is the epicenter of world missions? The local church. Who are the leaders of world missions? Elders. Do you see that? And another thing, the one of the most wonderful things about meeting the last two days, I've asked several of the guys a question and they've all responded in kind. I say, you know, brothers, when you go overseas, you're going to put those Bible institutes out there for training young men. Make sure that never takes precedent over planting a biblical church.
because that institute won't mean much if there's not a real church living it out. And every one of them said, brother, you're preaching to the choir. As a matter of fact, after talking to Christian Anderson and Greg and Martin Manton, I said, I'm not going to preach. I'll just have them come up here. Brethren, we're to be churchmen. Churchmen. Yes. We're to do world missions as a church. And yes, as churches, we can come together. But know this. Unity is never based on a common mission. That is where all these denominations go wrong and it is a slippery slope and you will soon fall into liberalism and politics. Missions can never be, can never be the unifying factor among believers. Not missions, something much higher, truth. Well-defined truth. Not just using the terminology, but defining what we mean. A definite Christ. Now, I want to say something just in my last thing here, very important. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, we see this, you know, he put in here, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And it seems to many that what he's just doing is giving us a formula for baptism. No, this is deep theology. And this is theology that is crucial for the mission field. We preach a very specific, a very defined God who has revealed himself in the scriptures as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the only way to be a part of the family of God is embracing all the doctrines that are interwoven in this baptismal formula regarding the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Brethren, I love Muslims. I love them. I pray for them. But they're not my cousins. They're not my next of kin. Their faith is not related to mine. Their faith is not some stepping stone God that gave them to reach the faith I preach. It's not. And if I love these people, Muslim, Buddhist, every sort of people on the planet, if I love them, I'm going to preach to them a very defined doctrine, a very defined redemption, a very defined God. Brethren, just all these translations, all these things that are going on that are just rot and all of them are done in somehow hopes. It's like some kid committee of let's help God all got together. Is Israel not enough lesson for you? Every time Israel sought to help God, what happened? Defeat. And every time they stood upon the word of God. We must preach the gospel, not a gospel. And I don't preach one gospel to one group and another gospel to another because all men are the same. The God I preach is the same and the gospel they need is the same. Do you see that? I remember years ago we were in Romania, Conrad and Bewe and I. And I don't even know if you remember this. And I remember Conrad was preaching on the scandal of the gospel. And I've used this illustration all over the world. And he kind of got riled up while he was preaching. And he said, all, all this nonsense of, of church growth and all these strategies. He said, you young men want to know how the apostle Paul planted churches? He got a big placard, as big as he could get, and he wrote on that placard the most scandalous message he could ever write, I preach Christ crucified, and he walked down the middle of the town. Brethren, again, let, let, me, let me, again and again and again and again, listen to me. Ours is not a mystical religion, but it is a supernatural religion. We preach to dead men. And there is no crowbar from the secular world that we can use to pry them out of a tomb. 
But you preach the gospel and Christ will rip the lid off the tomb and fill it with light and tell the dead to rise again. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Just look in church history. Who has shaken the globe? Preachers. You say, oh, I want to be like them. No, you be careful. Most of them died. I believe Brother Lawson has said the problem with preachers today is no one wants to kill us. <laughs> Brethren, when I stand in Croatia or Paris or the jungles of Peru, now please understand my language, you know my doctrine. I stand there as Ezekiel. And it's as though the word of God says, can these bones live? And as preachers, we say, Lord, I'll not presume upon you and say yes. I will not doubt you and say no. But this I will do. I will prophesy at your command. I will preach your gospel. And I will see dead men come alive. Oh, brothers. Oh, brothers. We need the word. We need to preach the word. We need to preach it. We need to know it. Ezra, what an example is Ezra. He studied the word. Studied the law to obey the law. To teach the law. The law was glorious, Paul says so. The law was a revelation from God. But if a man can give his life to the law, how much more should we give our lives to the gospel? How much more? Oh, brethren, be encouraged. Be encouraged. If you will just cut away from you the arm of the flesh, if you'll strip yourself of Saul's armor, if you will attack this thing just with the proclamation. Now notice, I didn't just say study. Study to proclaim. The proclamation of God's word and intercessory prayer. You say, I'm the runt of the litter. Yes, exactly, good. Now we can do something with you. Not many noble, not many wise. But those who in their weakness cling to the word of God and proclaim it. You say, Brother Paul, I have no wisdom. Then only speak God's word and you'll have all the wisdom in the world. You say, I have no strength. Then constantly ask for greater and greater manifestations of the Spirit's life and power. Not to do some silly thing like a TV evangelist, but to walk in holiness and proclaim the gospel with clarity. Oh, brethren, rise up. You pastors, never turn your eyes away from your flock. Never get so enamored with missions that you forget your primary responsibility is your flock, but lead your flock into missions. Lead your flock into missions. Now I'm gonna say one last thing and I'm going to go because I say this Every time almost I meet with young missionaries and there's many missionaries and missionary, those aspiring to be missionaries. And I always ask the missionaries this question, pastor, this is a good question for you too. I said, so what do you plan to do on the mission field? And they say, well, I plan to preach the word of God and prayer and, and, and pray and then plant a church. And then from that church, plant other churches. Is that your plan? I say, yes. I said, no. So what do you mean now? Now listen, this is nuanced, but it's important. Why do I tell them no? Brethren, you don't plant a church in order to plant another church. Because if you do that, if you've ever done church life, you're going to find that your church is going to fill up with a lot of broken, weak people 
or genuinely converted, but they cannot contribute much to your vision. And if your vision is to use a church, to plant a church, pretty soon you're going to be despising all the ones who most need your ministry. You plant a church here in the States, you plant a church on the mission field because you love those souls. That's why you plant a church. But I can promise you this, if you plant a church because you love those people, and I hear men all the time telling me they love the church, and I ask them this question, I said, do you love the church or do you love your ministry in the church? Because you love the church as much as you love the most difficult saint in your church. Brethren, if you will devote yourself to caring for souls, to winning souls, caring for souls, loving people, and being content with God's smile, God will mightily use you, and other churches will be birthed from that. I love it when sometimes I'll call a pastor and say, look, could you come with me and preach in a certain place? I would love to, but I've left too much this, this year. And, and my people need me, and I need them. You know, Paul, they're my heart. I love missions, but they're my heart, Paul. We don't use God's people to do God's work. God's people are the goal of God's work. Pour yourself out. Brethren, it is a great privilege to, to be here. It, it really is, preaching. But this is not the mark of God's approval. Someone asked a theological, philosophical question one time. Why would God plant the most beautiful rose he ever made in a forest where no man ever walked? How would that rose glorify God or bring glory to God? It brings glory to God because even though no man sees it, God sees it. You're looking for his smile, his smile, his approbation, his approval. You're looking for him. And may God's grace prosper you in all things according to God's will, brethren. All right? God bless.